the hydrogen atom is a pretty nice system from the perspective of quantum mechanics. If you become a chemistry major and go on and take physical chemistry, in fact, you'll solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, probably analytically, at least in class. What happens when we get to heavier atoms? What do the atomic orbitals look like, for example, for helium, and lithium, carbon, oxygen, the halogens? Well, the Schrodinger equation is hard for the hydrogen atom, as you'll discover in later courses, but it's essentially impossible to solve for atoms heavier than hydrogen in an analytical sense, in the sense of starting with an expression and deriving the energies and wave functions that fit that expression. However, the blessing here is that the hydrogenic atomic orbitals actually work fairly well for the heavier atoms too. But now there are some additional complications. We have more than one electron in the atom. That causes the subshells to have different energies since the shape of an orbital is now related intimately to its energy within a shell. The shell energies are also different and no longer fit the Rydberg equation. So while it's still true that greater n is correlated with higher energy, there isn't a clear-cut relationship here, and actually the relationship between the principal quantum number and energy differs for every element. However, there's a complication, here's a simplification, the same rules for quantum numbers still apply when we talk about the heavier atoms. So we need to kind of resolve and, and think about this issue of multiple electrons, especially as we build orbital energy diagrams for the heavier atoms. One of the important principles here is the idea that no two electrons can have the same quantum numbers. So we can't simply, for example, for carbon, put down six electrons in the 1s orbital and call it a day. It doesn't work that way. The spin quantum number can only either be plus one half or minus one half. And no two electrons can have the same two quantum numbers. So once we've put a plus one half electron, say, in the 1s orbital, we have to move on, put the next electron with a minus one half s in the 1s orbital as well. And then once that orbital's full, we have to keep moving up. So here's kind of a scaffold for the atomic orbitals of the heavier atoms. And to write what's called the electron configuration of a heavier atom, we simply fill it with electrons from lowest to highest energy. This is consistent with the Pauli exclusion principle, and it's known as the Aufbau principle, which is German for building up. So for example, if we wanted to build the electron configuration of carbon, which has six electrons, we'd put a spin up in the 1s and then a spin down, there's two electrons. We now must move up to the 2s level, because according to the Pauli exclusion principle, we can't throw another spin down electron in the 1s orbital, it doesn't work that way electrons are not allowed to have the same sets of quantum numbers. And so the next electron must go up in the 2s orbital. The fourth electron goes in the 2s orbital as well. It's still lower in energy than the 2p's. And now we have a completely filled 2s orbital. Notice at the n equals 2 level now that the 2p orbitals are higher in energy than the 2s orbitals, and that's distinct from the situation for hydrogen where the 2s and 2p orbitals were all at the same energy. So the next electron, the fifth electron, goes into one of the 2p energy levels. And now we have the interesting question of what to do with the next electron. Let's say it has spin down. We can put that next electron in with the first electron we added into the 2p subshell, or we can actually put that electron into one of the different orbitals within the 2p subshell that has just a different direction. Remember, right? Like if this is the 2p x orbital, this might be the 2p y orbital, for example. So what should we do? Well, Hund's rule comes to our rescue here and says that the proper way to do this that actually reflects reality is to put the new electron, first of all, with the same spin as the electron we put in before in actually the different orbital within the subshell. So don't pair electrons up unless you absolutely have to. The argument goes that there's an energetic penalty for pairing electrons up because if you're asking two electrons, for example, to sit both inside a 2p orbital, well, by definition, then they're probably going to be close in space since they obey the same probability distribution. They're likely to be in the same area close to one another. There's an energetic penalty associated with that that again, I must sound like a broken record by now, can be well explained just by Coulomb's law and the fact that negatively charged electrons repel one another. So Hund's rule says, put the new electron in a different 
orbital within the subshell if you can. So this is the electron configuration of carbon. If we continue going, for example, to nitrogen, we add another electron here. This is the electron configuration of nitrogen. For oxygen, which I'll write in red, we add another electron here. Now we have to pair electrons up. Fluorine contains one more electron, also paired up. And then finally we get back to neon, which has all of the electrons paired within the 2s and 2p orbitals, a completely full valence shell. The n equals 2 shell is completely full. If we look at this scaffold, we notice a pattern and some interesting things happening. In particular, the energy of the 3d level is lower than the energy of the 4s level, even though n equals 4 should have larger energy than n equals 3. The origin for this effect is, as you can see, the step up from the 3s to the 3d is greater than the step up from 3s to 4s, and so that puts the 4s lower than the 3d in energy. This happens for the scaffold, and the dirty little truth of this scaffold is that it's actually different for every atom, right? So while it's a useful guideline, to think of the energies of the atomic orbitals in this way. It's just a guideline, and you will see exceptions, particularly within the transition metals for electron configurations of the heavier atoms. That's just about all I'll say about it here, other than to note that this figure is one that's commonly used to kind of build up the scaffold from lowest to highest energy. We start with 1s, which is the lowest energy, and then 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, which should all make sense. But then we do the 4s is the next step up in energy, and then the 3d, and then the 4p, 5s, 4d, 5p and 6s, and then 4f, and so on and so forth. So these diagonal lines are showing you how the atomic orbitals progress from lowest energy to highest energy.